Good evening, everyone. Executive Dean, Professor Heather Zwicker, fellow colleagues, distinguished guests, and students. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Lecture. If we haven't met, my name is Robin Shields. I'm the new head of the School of Education here at UQ, and it's wonderful to see so many people here this evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands upon which we meet today, paying my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Their long-standing and ongoing spiritual and cultural connections to this country offer many important lessons to, for all of us working in educational research, and I recognize their important national and global contributions. I remind all of us here today that these lands have long been places of teaching and learning before there were, these buildings were here. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome Indigenous colleagues, guests, and students who are here this evening. The Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Lecture is an important annual event in the School of Education and a cornerstone of our vibrant research culture. It comes following the university's annual research and innovation week, during which colleagues in the school and students were nominated for several prizes. And it comes before the annual postgraduate research conference, which will take place tomorrow. Carolyn D. Baker joined the UQ School of Education. Just give you a minute for that, okay. Carolyn D. Baker joined the UQ School of Education as an associate professor in 1991, having previously held a position at the University of New England. While at UQ, she served as an elected member of the academic board and a director of research and postgraduate studies in the School of Education. She was widely recognized as an outstanding doctoral supervisor, successfully advising 25 candidates to their completion of their doctoral studies and receiving a university teaching award. As a mentor, she encouraged students to present their research and often invited them to join her at international conferences. Dr. Baker was also an initiator of the Postgraduate Research Conference, an annual tradition which continues to grow stronger year after year. Every year, this memorial lecture is held on the evening prior to the conference in a fitting tribute to an academic who dedicated much of her life to nurturing and supporting postgraduate researchers. Highly respected by her friends, colleagues, and students, her legacy continues to live on in many of her students who are here with us this evening, their students, and this annual lecture. This year's lecture marks 20 years since Dr. Baker's passing in 2003, and next year will mark 20 years since the establishment of the memorial lecture and annual prize. Recognizing these milestones, I ask all of us gathered here to consider donating to the Memorial Fund, as we have established a goal of raising approximately $8,000 over the next year to establish the lecture as an endowed prize. After the lecture, we'll be reaching out to all of you by email and to other friends of the school to encourage future donations. And this lecture will be followed in our program of alumni engagement and public engagement with an event on World Teacher Appreciation Day, which will take place uh, in CBD. We'll be reaching out to alumni and friends of the school for that too. It's now my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Jason Lodge, who will introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Sarah Howard. In addition to his role in the School of Education, Dr. Led, Dr. Lodge is the Deputy Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. He is currently serving as an expert member of the National Task Force on Artificial Intelligence and Education and is leading work with tonight's speaker, Associate Professor Howard, on reforming assessment in Australian higher education in partnership with the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, or TEXA. Welcome, Dr. Lodge. Over to you. Thanks, Robin. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, now that you had the introduction to the introduction, I get to do the introduction. Uh, 
I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today, pay my respects to Elders past and present, and extend those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room with us. I would also like to acknowledge Professor Heather Zwicker, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, our newly minted Head of the School of Education, Professor Robin Shields, Associate Professor Sarah Howard, who is an Associate Professor in Digital Technologies in Education, hence what we're talking about tonight, distinguished guests, colleagues, one and all. I could give you a long list of Sarah's many achievements. I've known Sarah for some time. Instead, I would like to start by telling you a bit of a story and then from that story tell you why I think Sarah is such a great speaker for tonight's event. So I've known, as I said, I've known Sarah for a while. Uh, a few years ago, her and I and a few others were involved in a centre of excellence bit. Now, for those who are not familiar, these are large research centres that involve numerous universities, tens of millions of dollars and years and years of um, work to, you know, as a collaborative thing in an effort to, to figure out some key problem. The centre was around artificial intelligence and education. We did not get past the expression of interest stage and a lot of the comments that we got were in the vein of artificial intelligence and education, that's not going to be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we are a couple of years later. Things have changed a little. In, in the time that I've worked with Sarah, I think what has impressed on me a lot about the work that she does is that I think when we, it comes to technology and education, we often get one of two kind of narratives out there. One, which we've had a lot of this year, is this is the most amazing thing ever, it's gonna change everything, oh my goodness, this is incredible. Anybody remember electronic whiteboards? Uh, didn't, quite <laughs> didn't quite work out like that in some instances. Or the alternate view that we often get is that this is the worst thing that's ever happened, it's gonna be the end of education, we're all gonna be replaced by robots, and so on. What I really like about Sarah's way of approaching all of this is that I think she provides a much more balanced view and a much more nuanced way of thinking about the role of technology in education. Um, and I'm sure we will hear a lot of that tonight, but I think given where we are currently in terms of what is happening with artificial intelligence, we've probably moved past the initial, you know, hype and, and activity around it, and we're really getting into the business of trying to figure out what is this thing and how might it actually be helpful, and how do we ensure that, you know, any of the risks that are associated with this new technology are, are not kind of realised in, in really harmful ways for students. So, Sarah will no doubt give us a view of that balanced and nuanced view of artificial intelligence and where we might be headed. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what she's got to say. So join me in welcoming Sarah. All right. I'll just move past that. <laughs> Let me just set up my bits here, my technology, my other thing here. Watch me navigate my surfaces. All right. So this indeed it is me, Associate Professor Sarah Howard. So thank you very much. So thank you for having me. Um, it's quite an honor to come up and be able to speak for this memorial lecture. Um, I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. And also, I will not repeat, but I will also like to acknowledge the school and university and those who are leading it for having me and for giving me this opportunity and to the family and friends who've come tonight. So thank you very much. And indeed, um, today, tonight, we are going to talk about AI, as Jason said, and I hope I can, I've provided a nuanced and um, uh, interesting core of it through for you, so we'll see how we go. So we are indeed going to look at AI in higher education, and but more importantly, we're going to think about what's new about it and where are we with it. So AI has caught our attention and our imaginations really significantly this year. It has been part panic and part excitement. So these two kind of competing areas that we have. As we all know, though, AI embedded tools Intelligent tutors, automation, various algorithms, I could go on and on, have been part of our world actually for a long time. 
We've had them in our hands, we have them in our homes, we're wearing them, they're everywhere. But we're now, now we see them. So the advent, not of generative AI, but of ChatGPT has really sent us over the edge. Um, but why this technology? So I don't really want to talk about ChatGPT today. I think we can move beyond that. Um, let's just have a think about AI in general, what it is now, what it means, and particularly what it means as a point of change. So let's first go back a little bit into our revolutionary history. So education, and many of us know this, has been on the verge of a revolution pretty much forever. We are perpetually just about to be completely renovated by a new technology that's, that's coming along. And this is something that we have, um, we've been struggling, struggling with for a while. So there's a lot of call right now saying that Gen AI is going to revolutionize education and even the world maybe. So regardless of the scope, it is not the first technology that's been prophesized to do this. So first we had film. And really, this was around 1900, 1910. We were no longer going to use books. We were going to just look at film. And then radio, sound came in. And then televisions, where the eye and the ear were married together. And we, would, we still have books. It just hasn't happened. We still look at where we are right now. We're even using the same format that we've always used. Personal computers, the internet, it was going to be democratic. Everyone could access everything. We're not there. Social media, really not there. Not democratic, it's all gone a bit funny in there. But it hasn't revolutionized education um, in the way that is often predicted. None of these technologies have. Ultimately, education is a large, slow, bureaucratic beast. And over the years, the different technologies have not changed it significantly. That is not to say that change hasn't occurred. So change has occurred. And we've adapted them for our educational purposes. So but given our history, is AI really going to revolutionize us? So is there something different about AI? Is it different from the other technologies? So is there something new about the now? I love this picture because I love the idea that we are baking in a truck on the side of the road and that that was a dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> My other favorite one is blenders and cars. Where is it? <laughs> Why don't I have a blender in a car? I, I love these kind of retro futuristic ideas that you'd want to do this, that you would need to bake in the street. But, you know, so this is again, it's, it, this is where we are with things. Is this something we really need to be doing? Is this something that we're interested in doing? So is there something new about, we'll say generative AI in particular, but AI more, more broadly? So what I think it's really made us do is I think it's made us sit up and think about our relationship with technology. What is it? What is that relationship? And really, our relationship with AI is a bit problematic. It has a lot of promise. It's like, it's like online dating. You think it's very exciting, but then when you meet it, it brings a whole bunch of baggage with it. <laughs> right? And you're like, oof. It's got years of popular media treatment. It's got Terminator. It's got all sorts of things where the lights go out. We're in a dystopia. We're in a utopia. We don't know where we are, but it's bringing all this baggage with us every time it comes to us. So I was at the airport this morning, um, and I picked up a copy of the Guardian Weekly in paper. I have brought it along with me because I, don't, I, I never deal with paper. I actually purchased this to read it, and the reason why is that it has a headline here, Chat, GPT, and Proust. And how could that not catch your attention, right? <laughs> so. I'm a, I'm a bit of a Proust hobbyist, and I'm not afraid to admit it. It's my own declaration. My cat is actually named Proust, so I was very interested in this particular article. Anyway, so it turned out it was a reprint of Elif Bautman's posted, writing posted on their blog, and the author was looking from a specific, for a specific quote in Proust from In Search and Lost Time, and if you've read Proust, you know In Search of Lost Time is, it's a little dense. So ChatGPT was the obvious, um, solution to finding a particular quote in it. So they said they wanted a quote on writing about love in the past, in the present, and how that past love inspired how you think about love in the present, right? Very Proustian, right? So it's, it's circular, it's repetitive, it's, it's the typical thing you get into. 
However, the conversation between ChatGPT and the author did not go particularly well. So the article, the author writes that their personal, they write of their personal and emotional reactions to what ChatGPT returned to them in response to this question. It's a series of battles. It's a series of insults to the, the point we had a conversation coming in that they got sassed by, um, by, by AI. So questions about how the chatbot was managing the particular author during this, this feeling that the author was, was that the responses were being, ga were being gauged to give them the answer that they should have, not the answer that they wanted. So these feelings that we have, so it, it actually, the author disapproved of ChatGP on several points and felt it needed to prove himself right against the AI, and, and also then wondered if ChatGPT was trying to get rid of him at a point. <laughs> so ultimately, the author feels that they were locked in a master-servant dynamic where ChatGPT was being sneaky and even dishonest about finding a quote to the text, that they, it wouldn't do it. And it, it's very elaborated. I brought it. You can read it if you want to. So in the end, the author feels they themselves were dishonest with ChatGPT. So it begins this kind of like abusive relationship that they're having with them. They felt insulted. And this was their relationship. This was their relationship with the technology. So to be fair, we personally, um, we personify and we, try, we, we apply motivations to our technology all the time. I yell at WhatsApp constantly because it refuses to give me the close out button that I want when I want to touch it. And I, and I yell at it. Now, What's different here is that you can actually engage in a two-way discussion, so that relationship becomes really different. So it's a different kind of relationship. So I gotta tell you, I've been laughing at this clip art for the last two days, so it's <laughs> really amusing me. So what does this mean for us? So the default position for new technologies is typically one of fear, of amb or ambivalence, or excitement. We have your, your classic bell curve for that. When it comes to AI, as with all unknowns, the issue is, is what we don't know, the lack of a control, and the level of unpredictability that we have with it. So this is no, by no means a comprehensive list, but these are several of the things that we think about when we come to AI that concern us. One is its autonomy. What is it doing? Where is it? It's doing things I don't have control of. It's a black box. The next one also, ironically, is the fact with some Gen AI, it's tangible and it's right there and it's still doing things that I don't know what to do with and I don't know what it's doing to me when I interact with it to the point of my author who is feeling that they're being almost mildly abused by ChatGPT. So the fact that it's also growing rapidly, it's out of control in the media, we see the idea of people wanting to call it back, of ceasing research on AI, things like this. It also has a long history of mystery and fear, as I've alluded to earlier in popular culture, but it also has a future of mystery and fear, particularly around what it does with us, what it does with us, and that we are subject to what it does to us. Is this fear warranted? Are these legitimate fears? For these issues, most of them are perceived risks, meaning that nothing is really at risk and nothing is really lost at this time. This is simply what we feel. The fears are largely emotional, and tell us more about us than they tell us about the technology. However, there are additional issues. And the, human, the humans that design and use these technologies and the effects that come with that can be real risks. There can be real losses around that. And yes, there are bad actors in the field, and these are actual risks. Um, the biggest one in higher education that we're looking at right now, and it's difficult to be speaking to a higher education audience and not mention it, of course, is cheating. What do we do with this? This is a legitimate risk as an effect from the technology. There are also issues of AI perpetuating inequalities, disadvantaging minority groups of users, ethical issues, protections of data, things like that that all come from this. These are real issues with significant effects and effects on real people. However, these are not necessarily new risks. These are risks of many technologies and things that we've been grappling with. The difference is that with the new AI, the new automation with large language models, that these risks are exacerbated. They are moving faster and faster. The volume and the frequency have hit us quite quickly, quantitatively more than previously. They're putting what we value in higher education at risk, in particular, the validity and the quality of the Australian higher education degree. So, but it is our work to figure out what to do in this space. 
with the current technologies and whatever pops up unexpectedly. It is indeed our work in higher education to begin to work out how to deal with this. Therefore, it's necessary to be critical and to come to terms with the role of AI, its role in our work, and what kind of relationship we want to have with it. Is it a relationship where we are, we are subject to abuse by it, or is it a relationship where we actively make decisions about how we want to use it? So, in that, we have to come to terms with this relationship, and this is really critical, in that we actually have to accept that we are in a relationship with the technology, and that it is different to a degree. So, and in that, there's a closeness that we have with this relationship. This technology is closer to us than others. And, and I say that because it's, it's something that we don't always see. So it's something that sometimes I can hold it, I can tangibly pick up my phone and hold it, and other times I'm not aware that it's, it's part of what I'm doing. So this is a, a complicated relationship. And I will say that it's closer, we can always debate in the Q&A about that. But it's important, again, to come to grips with, with where this technology sits inside what we do and how we want to negotiate it. So we need to ask more often, and everyone loves a Rose Luckin quote, because who else talks about AI as long as, long as Rose Luckin, so you can't miss with that one. So one of the things that we want to ask, the key questions that we need to ask ourselves more often so that we can be proactive and we can, we can cease to have the AI working on us is why are we using it? Why is the AI being used? So, and then also, what is it doing? Is it doing something that I need it to do, or is it doing something that I could do just as well or better? Or is it doing something of value? And what are these choices? Do I actually need it to be doing it? And what is the real affordance of it? In ed tech, we talk a lot about affordances, so what is it, what is it even really good at? It's a good example for you. I bought a new washer dryer, right? It comes with an app, and I love an app. I love a smart object, right? So anyway, I bought this washer dryer because it came with an app. So I'm standing in front of the washing machine and I'm like, I'm on my phone and I'm like choosing the cycle of wash. I've put the clothes in the wash, I'm choosing it. Everything seems to go to colors mixed on this washing machine for some reason, but I'm doing it on the app. And then I looked and I was like, how do I start it? I, I had to actually press the machine, like the actual washing machine. I was like, what's rubbish? <laughs> I still have to do it, like I still, but you know what it gave me? It was a really lovely graphic of laundry swishing around inside of a circle. And added bonus, it had a lovely little song it played at the end. And when my partner's doing laundry, it tells me on my phone, like I need to know, right? And then I message him and I say, great job. That's really good, really good work there. It's AI enabled. It says it will, it will tell the dryer it tells the dryer what cycle you used on the washing machine. It only goes to colors and mixed. It's really easy to choose it. They're sitting right on top of each other. They're Wi-Fi enabled. It's really no trick. I was like, is this really AI? Really, like, anyway, it's AI enabled. It's my smart washer dryer set. And I stand there in front of it. I was talking to my sister. She goes, so you still have to stand there? Yeah, I do. No one else puts it in. <laughs> I'm still doing laundry, but I could watch it from across the house. I could watch it move around. So is this really what we need to be doing? Is this really a technology that is, that is, is really benefiting me? Is there a real affordance in that? If I liked to stare at my phone and just watch stuff swish around, which, I mean, to be fair, sometimes I do want to do that, but it's not really, I don't, I don't need it, right? So we need to come to terms with how we balance this technology with ourselves, with the things that we need. So again, a lot of people in this space are looking at drawing on the question as what are we as humans and what is it that humans do? And this is quite, again, you would have seen this. We've had nine months of talking about what humans do and what machines do. I don't think we can actually say this enough because I think this is something that we have to do a lot of really hard thinking about. So humans are good at being critical, skeptical, innovative, creative. Importantly, that we are connected to our culture and our community and humans do this really well, and in that, we collaborate. And these are the things that humans do. And the question is, is in teaching and learning, how do we bring this out? 
in higher education, these are the things that need to be brought out in balance with the technology. That there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to that point. So let's wind it back. We're gonna go back to the technology a bit and we're gonna look at our, our complicated relationship with it. So catalyst. A lot of talk about AI being a catalyst. So, and if there are any chemists in the audience, I apologize for the use of the word catalyst. <laughs> But, you know, I'm being popular culture here, so we'll all, we'll all just, again, we can debate it in the Q&A. So, I don't actually think it's a catalyst, but anyway. So, some dimensions of our world, some of the actions that we, that we engage in are directly affected by AI because the AI, the AI is designed for those kinds of tasks. However, other dimensions brought into light issues that we have left to the side, um, issues that we maybe need to think about a little bit more, where the bringing of the technology forces us to begin to reconsider some of these points, reconsider some of our work, what we know, and how we interact. So it is touching in other spaces. So, and in that, it can act as a catalyst for change in areas that we don't necessarily expect. So, in some cases, these changes are related to the AI, as I said. In other cases, they're a result of changes in the way that we work and changes in the way of things that are happening around us and opportunities that arise, but also issues that, that we need to address. But it also is making us question the nature of knowledge. What is it that we know as humans and what is it that we need to learn? So in that, the nature of our relationships, our relationship with our technology, and what it is to be human. We actually have to think about what it is to be human. We usually take it for granted. So, and I think in there, there is the potential for some very significant change. Whether that's a revolution, or we're just kind of fiddling around the edges, I don't know yet. Again, we can, we can debate that. But I do think that as it touches beyond the technology, there's something interesting happening there. There is something new there. Because it is forcing us to reconsider how we do a lot of the stuff that we do, and forcing us to think about things that we may have taken for granted before. So this means as educators, we can't simply assimilate the technology. We can't integrate it like we have technologies in the past. It's just simply not that simple because there's more happening. Because we have to think about the nature of teaching and learning because we have to think about the nature of knowledge. What is it that we can do and the technology can do? And how can we use the technology well? And that's something that, that we have to really, especially in higher education institutions, we, we are the ones to do that work. We really have to think about that because it's all up for grabs. So this is my, my dream of a robot picnic. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm celiac, so the fact they've got a bag of bagels with them is, is completely enticing for me. So someday in the future when they fix celiac disease. So, <laughs> so what are we doing in new ways? I think it's really hard to say right now what we are in doing new ways, but something new is, is happening. Some say it's the speed of change. Some say it's the nature of human-computer interaction. I think really what's important is bringing us back to the question of what we are doing and what AI is necessary for, and to think where, where that plays out. So, and also to think about the things we might not need to do anymore. So there's lots of questions in that. So, what's also quite important is the idea of as humans and as machines, how are we doing things differently? How are we doing things uniquely? And what, there are some new things that we're able to do. I don't really know what those are yet, <laughs> but definitely there will be some. And a lot of them have to do with computational power and the p capacity to analyze data. But is that new or is it just simply different and faster? I think those are the things we still have to parse through. Um, the fact that things are faster, they can be done more accurately is interesting, but again, it's not changing, it hasn't changed us significantly yet. These are a quantitative leap, like they are significantly bigger than what we've done before. But we still struggle with the autonomy, that it's uncontrolled and that it's unknown to us. So again, are, is the reward that we are uncertain of worth the risk? Right now in higher education, the risk of the validity and the quality of our degrees, as it is across the world, is that's a tangible risk. However, the fact that our benefits are a bit ambiguous, that they are unclear, because we need a lot more research in the area, is is, is I think we're struggling to weigh that up. So, but it's not a reason to ban or to eliminate or to remove. It's a problem for us to solve. And that's what we need to look at. And again, we are the ones to solve it. 
we need to establish what the appropriate uses are. It's for us to lead for that. What is the benefit and what is the role in our lives? So we can do quite a bit of work in that space. So as academics, my favorite robot, as academics, um, particularly as new academics, postgraduates moving into the area, as established academics, people working in the field, this is, this is the work for us to do. Um, we play a significant role in how these technologies can be brought into the lives of the people that are beyond higher education and how our graduates go into the world and the change that they affect and how we prepare them to be able to do that. So how we bring the AI, the AI, I love saying that, it just sounds like it's actually a thing, it's not. How we bring it into the lives of our learners, we, how we point it towards industry, how we interact with industry to understand these technologies better and how it goes out to wider society. We have to choose to embrace these new, new technologies. The potential that something is new has to be available to us and it has to be, has to be there for us. Or we could go back to the fear. The fear shuts us down. And the potential risks, we retreat to, when we see potential risk, we retreat to tr traditional practices. The world will move on if we do that. And that is a, that is a significant risk. Although I haven't measured it yet, so I can't say that's an actual risk. I could say that's a potential risk. <laughs> you can come back to me on that. So in the position of working in higher education, we need to take a progressive view and a future-looking position. But to do this, we have to take stock. This doesn't mean accept everything. This absolutely does not mean that every new technology, because it's not just AI, it'll be something new coming, it'll be a new tool. We need, to, we need to understand it and we need to know about it to be able to make good decisions. However, it's a little more complicated than that, isn't it? It is, because right now we don't know what it is. We also have to consider our own competencies to be able to navigate this space and our capacity to be able to engage with it. So to understand where it can be used best and where we shouldn't be using it and to be able to pass that critical judgment on to our students. So where is the AI doing something that can't be done by humans? And what are we doing? So again, what is the balance of our relationship? What are we all doing in our daily lives, in our work, and for our students? So because I'm an idealist, which I'm not at all, actually, <laughs> but because I am today, um, our approach to the unknown should be to educate, to educate ourselves, to educate our students. It should be our position when we think about building our capacity to navigate the space with technologies that come in and to be able to identify it. So to be able to also consider what are the people that teach, what are our students' capacities to do the work they need to do and to go into their future pr pr professions. So to get down to brass tacks, so now we're done with the theoretical portion of the evening. <laughs> How do we do that? And there are a lot of questions around that. So what is the future landscape? What, is, what does it mean to prepare ourselves? So when we think about how to go about that process. How do we enter into this world? How do we prepare our students? So we need to be thinking about preparing our students quite literally for the unknown. Rather than fearing the unknown, we must provide them with the skills and capacities to do that. Because while well, today it might be Gen AI, chat GPT, it could be something else later on. It could be, you know, alien arms that we use. I mean, who knows what it's gonna be? It could be almost anything. It could be rocks that talk to us that perform complex functions and do my washing for me finally and actually put the laundry in the washing machine. So in this, we also need to ensure integrity and we need to ensure equity of the learning. This, this is our challenge. This is the one we're really grappling with right now. And also how to prepare students for the future work. Probably not surprising. This is what we've been trying to nut through for the last nine months and thinking about how do we in fact get this to happen if we don't know what work students are or aren't doing. So in that, assessment drives everything, right? Ah, uh, maybe not everything. <laughs> I, I am being provocative here. So I'm not an assessment person per se. So I'm an educational technologist. My interest in assessment is how assessment drives learning design. So they're a proper assessment, people to do that. Mine is looking at the flow through from assessment into how we design learning, what we ask our students to do, and the tools that we bring into that. How do these tools shape what students learn, how they learn, and those experiences? So, and in that, we reach an assessment. 
right? So assessment is part of that process. How are we measuring what's happening? But what we, what we choose to use as assessment is driven, and what we choose to use as the resources we bring into that space is driven by our discipline, is expect, expectations from the workplace, the forms of knowledge, and I could go on with that. So when we think about the kinds of learning experiences that we want to bring to students, when we consider AI as part of that learning experience, and really at the end of that road, how do we understand what they've done, it brings us back to the question of what we want to be doing in that space, and how, how do we do it? What should the AI be doing? And what, what do we need our students to be doing? So, as was mentioned earlier in the introduction to Jason, we are, I'm currently involved with Jason um, in looking at this question and looking at how we, how we deal with AI in assessment. So here we have two guiding principles, and this is from the work that Jason is leading. So he's sitting over there. In assessment reform for the age of artificial intelligence and work that we're doing with TEXA. And this is also with um, Professor Margaret Bierman and Professor Phil Dawson, both from, from Deakin, and a range of other experts from around the country, and we got together for a couple of days and put our heads down to it, and had a big think about AI in assessment, particularly in higher education, to think about now that we are here, how do we actually navigate the space given what we perceive as the risks and given what we need our students to be able to do? We have two guiding principles for this. So the first is assessment and learning experiences equip students to ethically and actively participate in a society pervaded with AI. So in this, AI, we accept, is a catalyst for change, but it's unlike change we've seen in the past, if nothing else, for the speed, for the speed that it changes and the way that we interact with it. Again, we can debate the other nuance of that. But it does not just influence how we assess, it influences what's worth assessing. And this gets us down to the idea of thinking about what is knowledge, what is knowledge now with these technologies, and how are students learning and what are they learning, and how do we understand this. In this, it includes the ability to use tools, as well as a broader understanding of the ethics, the limitations, and the biases, and the implications of AI. However, number two, forming trustworthy judgments about students learning in a time of AI requires multiple inclusive contextualized assessment approaches. So in that, no single assessment is really going to do the job, that we have to think about multiple assessments, different types of assessments, and that these would be triangulated. And this gets to some of the risks that, that, that we see. So the idea is how we think about bringing AI into teaching and learning, but also our capacity to mitigate some of the risks that we observe with it. So through this, we have five propositions about how we might approach that work, which some of you experienced earlier today, and now I'm going through. <laughs> so the first one is that in these designs, so thinking about how we design learning, how we design to assessment, and thinking about how AI comes into it, and looking at what are key ways that this needs to happen or rather guidance and how this could happen. And this work was truly to provide some guidance for the sector to be able to think about and start to get our collective heads around AI in this space, in our new space. It's unlikely to be going somewhere, so we really need to come to terms with it so we can actually actively make decisions and begin to wrestle back some of the control. So in this, appropriate authentic engagement with AI, so this is again, learning to critically engage with the role of AI in learning. So, but also how students learn to value the role of AI in their own study, in their work, and in their future work. And in this, we argue that a programmatic, a systemic approach that is aligned with the discipline and the qualifications is the way to think about the educational design of this. That it should be the assessment and the use of AI should be across a program of study. And this is where we start to touch on the idea of multiple assessments, triangulation, it provides the space for that. Not to say that all assessment needs to include AI and everything has to be embedded with AI, but to think critically about where it's most appropriately used and to think about how it drives learning and how it drives the experiences that we want students to have and what they need to be able to do, really. And in that, it should reveal the process of learning over time. We should be able to see how students, in the context, 
to understand their sense-making processes and how they ultimately know and what they can do. Also critical in this is the capacity for students to work appropriately with each other, but also with AI, that they are able to collaborate and that it's quality collaboration, and that quality work comes with this. And so this doesn't mean, again, that everything involves AI and everything is group work, but where is it most effective? And again, very much down to a design issue and how we think about this. But at the end of the day, so looking at security on meaningful points of the program to inform decisions about their progression and about completion. So where is it necessary that we see what students can do themselves on their own, where is it necessary to identify key assessment moments that really assess what students can do? Other assessments might have collaboration with AI, they might be able to use different tools, but we create those appropriate uses, and at times, it's necessary to be able to do it yourself. So these are our propositions. They include ways of working with AI, but also ways of working with AI that help to mitigate some of the concerns, because we do have to think about that in that balance of how we're working with the technology. This is, these are important considerations. And again, this is to provide some guidance. This is the first step in this process. But to provide guidance to help us start to frame the thinking around where these tools sit in the work that we do. But also to build validity and assessment and to consider how to create learning experiences that provide opportunities for us to, to ensure that validity and that AI is used appropriately and that we are building capacity and competence in our students to be able to use these. However, once again, peeling the onion back, we have to be able to do this as well, because it's, it's not, we're, no one's quite there. How do we actually do this? So, UNESCO's done some thinking on this. Lots of people have been doing thinking on this. So, what I'm talking about now are the competencies of academics, the competencies of the institution. And they're indeed two different things, and they are very much both critical. So, just also a small caveat, they use the term, sorry, go to my next slide. <laughs> so, small caveat in this, when we think about AI competencies and the competencies that we're developing, some refer to them as literacies, some refer to them as competencies, so capabilities, we'll go with competencies. Right now, we can debate later. So one of the things we need to think about um, is, in fact, what we as academics can do, what, what we do as lecturers, what we do as tutors, what we do as subject coordinators, what we do as program coordinators. So what are we, and even up to the programmer, programmatic level of learning and teaching, do we know what our choices, what choices we want, and how do we equip the people that need to actually implement this to be able to do it? So, as I said, UNESCO's been doing some good work in this. A lot of people have been doing work in this space, actually for several years, much before the, uh, the advent of generative AI. But they actually, UNESCO actually had a um, digital learning week where they released the frameworks. So this should be accessible within the next week or so. These are primarily focusing on schools, but very applicable to higher education, particularly in the broad scope of how we deal with the technology. So, Again, this is looking at how we teach and learn in an AI integrated context, assuming that we can't avoid it, that this is inevitable. So when we think about this, the first level of it is the idea of how we deal with ourselves with the relationship, but also how the institution takes action in this space. So how does the institution take action in terms of AI literacy and what that looks like at, as a society? And again, this is critical work at the institution. This is work for higher education institutions to come together and make a choice about how to deal with these technologies. And that has to be done at the institutional level. Individually, looking at what are the competencies required of those actually teaching? What is it that they need to, do, that they need to know and that they need to be able to do to enact that vision from the institution? So it is indeed two levels, and both need to be addressed. This is not rocket science. This is your basic change management. This is your basic structure and agency. But both are required. One is not, is not possible without the other. So in this, though, what is critical and what comes out in these competencies is the idea of thinking humanely. 
thinking ethically, thinking humanely, and thinking truly about how we make sure that inequalities and harms don't come to students. These are competencies that we need to be able to have to identify when these tools are not necessarily good actors. So in that, to be able to enact these three points, we in fact have to know how do we deal with the unknown. It's not necessarily innate. It's not something everyone knows how to do. And how does the institution want to deal with the unknown? How does it prepare the staff? How does it think about this in terms of what students need to be prepared to do when they leave the institution? What, in terms of inequalities, in terms of equity, what's important for the institution to prioritize? How do we value that? And how do we help the people that we want to embody those values. This is very much a group endeavor. It's very much group work. And then how do we connect with industry to think about how we prepare for what students need to be prepared for? And it is not something AI dealing with artificial intelligence is not something that can be done independently in any way. It's multidisciplinary. It's multi-sector because it touches everything that we're doing. Again, faster and in furrier ways, which comes from a comedy sketch, <laughs> but, but definitely in ways that, whether they be new or different or old or the same, they are something that we have to address and we need to address actively. So as leaders in this space, we actually need to decide what is going to be appropriate. What new ways of working do we want to take on? And what new forms of knowledge do we think are actually valid? So rather than it being dictated by what we see the, the chatbots spitting out as knowledge, which we, as we know, isn't necessary knowledge and can be a hallucination, which is interesting as well. And I'm not a philosopher, but you could debate that there's some knowledge in there. So again, we can talk about that. But we have to decide how we want to do it. And it has to be soon. We have to begin this work quite soon. And we decide what's going to be appropriate. And we communicate that as institutions and as individuals to those who we need to learn it. So I argue that if there is something new happening, that we are very much a part of that. We are part of that action. So is this a new time? Is it new for education? Is it new for us as humans? Is there a difference between AI and other digital technologies? Um, I'll argue that it's the collaboration. I'll argue that it's the relationship we have with it, that it's more contentious, that it's faster, that it's something that we can do different kinds of things. Whether it's truly new, time will tell. Or if it just becomes like my washing machine and I become frustrated with it and it becomes mildly interesting, we'll see that as well. Like to Jason's point with the interactive whiteboard, which Robert and I were speaking about earlier, the interactive whiteboard, and I said, and I'll always say this, I think is one of the best marketing scams known in the education world. <laughs> I mean, wow, good job, <laughs> smart technologies. You know, particularly how, you, how do you sell something that's collaborative but only one person can touch it? I mean, I just think that's genius. <laughs> we did figure it out. It took us a little while, <laughs> but we did get there. <laughs> but at the same time, we don't know where the technology is going to go. So, but we do need to think about is the is, is, is the work and what we are doing with it now and how we navigate it. That's why it's important to look at the unknown and to think critically about how we want to use it, not to be passive, and to be problem solvers. And in our future work, the things that become important are these capacities. And these capacities are things that are not new. These are things that we've always been good at. These are things that we've always been striving to identify in our assessment and in our work and in our learning. They are not new. They become more important now because maybe we have time to prioritize them more. Maybe we need to hold our own ground. But now, we need to, it's the opportunity to look at these more and to take the opportunity, even though you know, we still have assessment. Good assessment is still good assessment. AI doesn't change that. But maybe now we have the opportunity to really focus on what we really want to be assessing. Maybe it's a time to take advantage of that change. In conclusion, so many of the things that AI has brought to light are things we know we needed to change and things that the speed and the rate that it has come to us 
simply has blown the doors off. And that's something that is interesting. Whether it's new or not, we will see later. We will know, and time will tell. For example, my don't, I do not have a blender in my car. And if anyone does, I think that's, you know, also pneumatic tubes, we don't use them. Like only banks. Why is that? Like, you know, that was a good technology. You know, we should be able to send, th I should be able to send someone snacks. You know, like, come on. Anyway, time will tell with that. <laughs> we can see that AI can help us see these things. It can help us perform certain functions. Whether these are important or not is for us to decide. So if it's new, if it's not new, does it lead to us to a revolution? Does it lead us to harm? Does it leave us, lead us to utopia? We don't know. Regardless, as academics, as higher educational institutions, we actually can lead the way rather than being led by the technology. We actually can take control of some of it. We actually don't need to worry about losing control or the unknown because we can define what that is. And that's what this opportunity provides us and what this technology offers us the opportunity to think really carefully about. So, thank you. Tonight, it's my pleasure on behalf of John Baker, Carolyn Baker's son, to present the Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Prize for 2023 and read to you a letter from John himself. But first, a little bit of information about the prize. The Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Prize, which was originally the Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Scholarship, was established in 2004 and was first awarded in 2005. The purpose of the prize is to provide an annual contribution to allow a postgraduate research student studying in the discipline of education at the University of Queensland to attend and present a paper at, the national, at a national or international conference. Carolyn often presented her work at such conferences. She believed in encouraging students to present their work in progress or papers from their completed theses often inviting them to join her in attending conferences overseas. Thus, the purpose of this prize fits in well with her aims and intentions. The value of the prize is $1,000. The prize was instigated by Carolyn's son, as we've been told, and is a wonderful way in which her son, her family, her friends, her colleagues have honored her memory. I would like now to announce that the Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Prize for 2023 is awarded to Aaron Teo. Could Aaron please come forward? I just want to say a few things about your application. The title of the conference that Aaron will present is Giving Voice to the Truth of school-based anti-Asian racism, a critical auto-ethnographic conjuncture. The conference paper will be given at the Australian Association for Research and Education, or the AARE conference, in November at the University of Melbourne. Aaron described his paper in this way. Weaving together critical auto-ethnography with composite narratives from interviews with fellow migrant Asian teachers this paper will interrogate Asian Australian teachers' personal and professional race-making practices. In so doing, it simultaneously captures the continuities and challenges of Asian Australian racialization within schools, and as well as the possibilities for minority teachers to act agentively in restoring anti-racist futures in schools. In the application for the prize, Aaron also was asked to explain the similarities between his work and that of Associate Professor Carolyn D. Baker. Aaron said, my work parallels Associate Professor Baker's through our shared use of ethno-methodologies to locate culture and unravel systems of power for more inclusive futures. For instance, in the same way that my co-constructed auto-ethnographic research focuses on foregrounding the silenced voices 
and agency of migrant Asian Australian teachers as a cultural group. Associate Professor Baker's work was often concerned with how children, instead of merely being the objects of conversation, could become active participants in the dialogue with adults. In other words, Associate Professor Baker's work advocated for previously silent voices and in so doing, challenged the established social order for a certain stakeholders in positions of power. Aaron, it's my pleasure to give you this award. I'd now like to read to you the uh, letter from John Baker. Good evening to everyone, and welcome to the Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Lecture. I'm sorry I'm not able to attend this evening, as I'm currently overseas, as is often the case. And I certainly hope it's a nice evening in Brisbane. This year marks 20 years since my mother's passing. And I'm very grateful that this event is still going strong. Thank you to the University of Queensland for the continued support and for recognising my mother's legacy. Thank you also to everyone who has generously contributed to the prize over the years, which has been so important. Tonight is also an occasion for friends and colleagues to gather, reconnect and share memories. I know that Jim and Sue Irvine have traveled from the, uh, New South Wales today, and I'm sure that others have also traveled to be here tonight. I hope there is an opportunity for some of you to catch up after the lecture, as you often do. I'd like to thank Associate Professor Sarah Howard for delivering tonight's lecture, Navigating AI in Higher Education. What an interesting topic, and obviously very relevant and an issue touching so many professions. Congratulations to Aaron Teo, this year's recipient of the Carolyn D. Baker Memorial Prize. Your area of research and conference paper is so important and something my mother would have strongly supported. I hope this prize helps you in progressing your work and I wish you all the best with presenting at your chosen conference. I'd like to thank Professor Susan Danby, myself, Christopher Van Kreinord, Associate Professor Jess Harris from the University of Newcastle, and Dr. Simone Smala from the School of Education, all of whom contributed their time to be on this year's selection committee, and Dr. Liz Edwards, who managed the application and selection process for the prize. And finally, thank you to Professor Tisha Morrill, even though she's not here, Head of the School of Education for your support for both the lecture and the prize over the past fi five years. I very much appreciate everything that you have done and wish you all the best in the future. I look forward to working with the new head of school, Professor Robin Shields, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you to you all and have a wonderful evening and I hope to see you all next year. John. Hi everyone. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Dr Elizabeth Edwards and I'm the Director of Research here in the School of Education. And I have the lovely uh, pleasure of uh, bringing this uh, event ceremonies to a close. But before I do, I too would like to thank Sarah Howard uh, for her most informative presentation and of course our own Jason Lodge for facilitating uh, such thought-provoking discussions uh, on the challenges for higher education of generative AI. Uh, it was great to hear the pros and cons and, or should I say, the how-tos of how we navigate uh, this and especially from such world-leading experts. I would now like to call upon uh, Professor Robin Shields, who has a appreciative gift for Sarah, so if you could step forward. 
so much, Sarah. That was thought-provoking, interesting, really important for all of us to hear. On behalf of all the school, thank you very much. We have here some artisanal, handcrafted, non-AI generated chocolates <laughs> from the local Musa chocolate factory. Maybe. Hopefully mm -hmm. gluten-free. Yes, you can make it. <laughs> we hope you enjoy that. Thank you very much. And thank you again. Next, congratulations once again to Aaron Teo and Best Wishes for your upcoming presentation at AARE. Finally, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, our C.D. Bacon Memorial uh, Lecture continues as the School of Education's peak research event, and it was lovely to see so many familiar and new faces here again tonight. So could we have a final round of applause for all those uh, that made this event such a success behind the scenes and in front of you? And also, please join us for some refreshments around in the Playhouse Courtyard. So we might play Follow the Leader if you haven't been here before, but it's out this door and up a uh, grass verge. Oh, we can go up the back way. Up the back way, past the uh, bathrooms if you need them, and across the lawn you'll find the Playhouse Courtyard. We'll see you there. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>